So welcome everybody. We're just waiting a few minutes for everyone to dial in. Just wait another couple of minutes, the numbers are going up. Okay. Hi, everybody. There's a few more people joining. But I think that we can make a start now. So thanks, everybody, for dialing in. Um, and welcome to today's webinar from the Element Project team. This webinar has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our project website. So feel free to share um, or rewatch if there was anything that you wanted to revisit. My name is Heather McClarty and I'm one of the project managers at the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. My focus is on disruptive innovation in the wind, wave and tidal sectors. Before joining the Catapult, my experience was in aeromechanical engineering before deciding to work in the renewable energy sector. Element, which stands for Effective Lifetime Extension in the Marine Environment for Tidal Energy, is a 5 million euro project which is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme and is set to end next year. At the end of 2020, we held our first webinar, which covered the technological innovation under the project, which is to introduce artificial intelligence approaches to tidal energy, reducing costs by 17%. Today, we'll update on the project progress, and we'll also focus more on the social, economic, community and environmental aspects of tidal energy. You'll be welcome to put any questions to the panel using the Q&A functions on Zoom, at the bottom of your screen. I'll now hand over to the panels to introduce themselves. Anik? So hello everyone, uh, I'm Anik Leonard and I'm a business analyst at IDITA's Energy and Special Projects Department. Uh, IDITA is a Belgium regional development agency. We have an extensive project development experience with a focus on community involvement to maximize local use of green energy. Our interests include wind, solar, hydro, as well as tidal for today. We have partnered with NOVA since 2016 to deliver the Shetland Tidal project and to work in the Enfet and Element projects. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Nolwen Kivian. Uh, I'm a marine ecologist uh, working at France Energy Marine within the environmental integration of marine renewable energy team. And my focus is in Baltic communities, uh, including biofueling of uh, MRE device and um, assemblages living within sediments at uh, MRE sites. Uh, and I'm involved in the element project. Thank you, Evelyn. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Evelyn Gaborio. Um, I'm in charge of uh, the development within France Energy Marine. Uh, France Energy Marine is uh, a private research and development uh, institute in France, and we have um, we are 40 persons uh, working in the field of uh, research and development to support uh, the development of offshore renewable energy. Uh, in France, Europe, and of course, around the world. 
you. And last but not least, Peter. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Peter Hubert. I am a senior analyst for Nova Innovation. Uh, Nova is a tidal energy company. Um, we, so we develop and deploy tidal energy turbines. And we're, we are the driving force behind the Shuttle Tidal Array. And we're also part of the Element and OnFET project. Thanks, Peter. And that takes us nicely into your presentation on the Shetland Array and the family of Horizon 2020 projects that NOVA um, are leading. So I'll hand it over to you to share your screen. Thanks, Heather. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Let's, let me know if you guys can see the slides. All good? OK, so I'll just be giving a quick introduction into the Shetland Tidal Array, which is Europe's living tidal energy laboratory. Um, I'll give a quick introduction about Nova Innovation first, just to kind of set the scene about who we are. So Nova was founded in 2010 in Edinburgh. And we have been the first in the world to successfully deliver an offshore tidal energy array, which is in the Shetland Tidal Array. And that was in collaboration with Edeta uh, in 2016. We currently have projects under development in Scotland, Wales, and in Canada. And you might have seen our announcement last week about our new project in Isla, where we'll be using tidal energy to power some of the local distilleries that produce whiskey. Uh, we've deployed five tidal turbines in total, and we are scheduled to deploy 17 more over the next few years. And we are part of both the OnFET and the Element project. Uh, we'll be talking more about those later. So the Shetland Tidal Array, just to kind of set the scene where we are, Shetland is the northernmost part of the United Kingdom. So kind of right there. And our site is in between the two northernmost islands of the Shetland Tidal Array, Yell and Unst, you'll find the Blue Mill Sound, which is where the array is located. This is kind of a nice photo of how peaceful it can be up there with our, uh, our tidal turbines are actually deployed, so you can see there's no visual impact. It's not always this peaceful. This is some footage um, of the deployment of some operations we did last year. It's kind of get a little choppy uh, at the top. So a little timeline of the array. We've actually been working on the array since 2011 when we got our seabed lease for our first 30 kilowatt tidal turbine. Uh, that turbine was deployed and exported power to the grid in 2014. In 2016, we then delivered the uh, world's first offshore tidal array, which is deploying three of our Nova M100 turbines. Uh, and since 2016, 2017, the array has been part of a, an array and a host of different EU R&D funding, including OnFET since 2016 and recently Element. We've also... Um, We've, it's also home to the world's first uh, baseload tidal power station uh, in collaboration with Tesla. And we'll be talking a bit more about that later. In the bottom, you see uh, a photo of our operations when we deployed the Ford turbine in the array. Um, and you'll get some more photos of that soon as well. So just a quick overview of the turbines we've deployed at the array. This is the Nova 30, uh, 30 kilowatt tidal turbine. This was our very first turbine. Uh, three bladed. One of the blades is actually in the museum in uh, in Edinburgh at the moment. If everyone you can go see it there. Um, so that turbine was deployed in 2014. Has been decommissioned since. It was uh, we've been fully decommissioned the turbine. We actually did a drop cam of the um, uh, of the seabed afterwards to see there was no impact uh, remaining afterwards. Uh, then, after we used the learnings from the Nova 30 to create the Nova M100, which is our 100 kilowatt tidal turbine, it's not big. You can see some average size engineers around it, um, but it is a chunky turbine, and those have been deployed. So this is the third one called Charlotte. All the turbines have names, except for the Nova 30 for some reason. I don't know why that doesn't have a name, but yeah, this is Charlotte. The other two turbines were Elsa and Betty. Um, so. So you can tell we've already incorporated some of the major learnings we've incorporated from the Nova 30 was we actually reduced the number of blades uh, from three to two, which makes it easier to deploy the turbine. Um, I think so, yeah. So the way these work, this is, this is our subsea structure that sits on the seabed and remains in place uh, for the duration of the project. The turbine can then be lifted and installed um, 
from this can you can decouples from the structure and can be taken onshore for maintenance. Uh, these are just gravity based, so they, there's no drilling involved, which minimizes environmental impact. So we just basically add concrete blocks to keep them in place. Um, so in 2018, we we did something uh, pretty unique, which is we created a base load tidal power. Um, so one of the benefits of tidal energy is that it's perfectly predictable. Uh, so we can predict minutes, months, days, even years in advance, how much we would be producing at any given point in time. Combining that with energy storage, you can create reliable base load export. So you can see here, this is actually footage from our um, actual exports. You see a nice base load steady output to the grids. Uh, what that means is that tidal can not only compete with other forms of renewable, but can actually provide base load power to the grids and compete with forms of base load generation, such as coal and nuclear in the future. Um, talking a bit more about the projects that have been happening. Uh, so one of the major projects that we've been a part of since 2016 is the UNFET project or the Enabling Future Raise and Title project. Um, we're really good at coming up with acronyms. Um, so the goal of that project is basically to deliver commercial bankable tidal energy. And we're doing this by focusing a lot on the Shetland Tidal Array, not only by scaling it up from three to six devices, we'll also be moving those devices around to study wake impacts, but also by increasing learnings from the actual array and the actual operations of the array. Um, so for example, we did a full uh, maintenance on the turbines in 2019, where we took all three turbines out and put them back in in under three weeks, which was a record at that point. Uh, ever since, we've hit record array performance with availability of 90%, and we actually, turbines are still spinning happily. Um, we also, we'll tell you a bit more about this, but we actually, the first turbine, the first extension uh, turbine went in in August this year in the middle of uh, COVID. And we've also been continuing to do environmental monitoring, uh, but no one will talk more about that later. Um, so the next step for the project is we will be installing T5 and T6. So the fifth and sixth turbine will be going in um, soon, and then we'll be moving them around to study wake effects. We're also continuing to monitor and optimize our array interactions uh, to continue to cut the cost of energy down by 40%. Um, this is just a nice photo of operations of deploying. I think this is Betty going in. Yeah, this is the second turbine uh, going in in 2016. Um, so we hit a major, oh, so there's a few other things we've been doing under OnFET, just kind of highlight a variety of things that are happening. This is um, a photo taken during maintenance. You can see this quite a lot of biofouling on the turbine. Um, we've since found a solution for this, so the blades are now coming out completely clean. Uh, so we don't have any biofouling issues anymore. Uh, this is a uh, instrumentation kit developed by Oric for UNFED project. Uh, with the idea is that this goes and sits on top of the substructure to gather data while the turbines are in for maintenance. Um, this is um, this was one of the in, in, um, this was the students visiting our maintenance facility in pre-COVID times. Um, just as some footage of the turbine operating. Uh, this is our tidal turbine control center in Edinburgh where we actually control the turbines up at Shetland. And this is just a nice output graph. You can kind of see how reliable tidal energy is and how it comes and goes up and down the entire time. So uh, as I mentioned before, we in 2019, as part of OMFET, we did uh, maintenance on all three of the turbines, which we took them out and we put them back in. We took them out in Shetland, drove them all the way down to Edinburgh. Uh, and then put them back in the water within three weeks. Uh, we got some really great footage of that, so we decided to make a quick little video uh, in collaboration with Oric. So I'll try to play this for you. I'm hoping the sound comes true. How about let's see if this works. Thank 
Ready, none of the innovation team are coming in for their scheduled pit stop. In come the turbines. For the first time, the Nova engineers are going for the treble treble. Three turbines out at once. Service and back in record time. This performance by the team more than half the cost of scheduled maintenance. And that's it. Lights on and away we go. Moving tidal power over the finish line. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned before, these turbines have been deployed since 2019 and are spinning uh, happily still. Again, so in August of last year, we deployed the first of the new turbines going in. So the, four, the first of the on-fed extension turbine, which was the Nova M100 direct drive. Um, this turbine was actually developed as part of another Horizon 2020 project called D2T2. Um, and it is a direct drive version of our M100. So it's a full generational update. What we've done is we've taken out the gearbox and replaced it with a direct drive generator increasing liability, increasing availability, and reducing CapEx costs. Um, we've also the complete redesign of the substructure you can kind of see here. Um, this is another nice photo of the turbine. You kind of see the scale with the ferry in the background. So it hasn't gone up. This is, it hasn't gone up in size. They're still what we call extremely packable, ready to ship anywhere around the world um, turbines. Um, so this is photo of deploying the substructure. So the way we normally do this is we uh, deploy the substructure, add in the concrete ballast and drag it in place. And this is just a photo of the turbine going in. Uh, name was Unis. So that's the fifth turbine with a name. Um, I, so people will notice one missing, Doris. Doris is actually our 50 kilowatt turbine we were using for the element projects, which we'll talk a bit more about uh, next. So, Another big project, and the reason we're all here, is the Element project, um, which also is gaining a lot of benefits from the Shetland Tidal Array. So as part of Element, what we're doing is we're optimizing our turbine control system. We're doing this by integrating artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve how to improve the sensors of the turbine and actually how we control the turbine. Improved control provides us with increased yield, so we can delay our cutoff time. It also reduces capex because we don't need to uh, we don't need as many expensive sensors anymore, and it increases reliability and availability with the ultimate goal of cutting cost of energy by 17 percent. Uh, so far, so the project's been going since 2019. What we've done, we've the designs have been completed and verified. We've upgraded to control in the existing turbines, and we're also doing continued environmental monitoring in the array. Uh, we know we'll talk a bit more about that, and what is going to happen over the next two years is we're going to complete the onshore and offshore tests. So both in Shetland, as well as in France with our 50 kilowatts uh, RE50 turbine, which is being, it's, a, it's an old turbine from a water street project that's being redeveloped for the element project. So we're going to demonstrate our control system with the goal of further reducing the costs and making tidal energy uh, a commercial reality. Um, and I think that is it for me. Uh, I'm not sure if we've had her back to you. Thank you, Peter. And then I'll hand over to Noe, if you can share your slides. Yes, uh, I'm just uh, looking for Um, I cannot find my slide actually in the in the shared screens. Uh, sorry. Okay. Yes. Meantime, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat box. I think it's all right now. Can you see my screen? Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Isa. And uh, hi again, everyone. Um, so during uh, my presentation today, I will actually wear two hats. Uh, first, um, I'll speak uh, as an analyst involved in the uh, OES environmental task uh, to present you 
the state of the of the art regarding um, um, the environmental effects of tidal turbines. And then um, I'll speak as a research fellow involved in the environmental assessment uh, work ongoing in the in the element project. So to set up the context uh, of uh, the first part of my presentation, uh, I'd like to present you what is the uh, OES environmental uh, and one of its main results. Uh, so OES stands for Ocean Energy System Environmental and uh, was formerly known as uh, Annex 4, maybe uh, you recall uh, this, um, this name. And uh, it was established by the International uh, Energy Agency, uh, Ocean Energy Systems in 2010 to examine uh, the environmental effect of marine renewable energy. And this task, this initiative is led, um, is coordinated by uh, Andrea Coping and her collaborators from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, this initiative uh, currently gathers 15 national representatives or uh, analysts uh, who regularly meet um, to, to discuss ongoing research and information regarding environmental effects of marine, marine renewable uh, energy. Uh, in order to progress um, the marine renewable energy industry uh, in an environmental manner. Uh, and my colleague Morgan Lejar and I uh, are the French uh, analysts uh, for the uh, OES environmental task. And Kate Smith uh, from Nova Innovation uh, was one of the UK analysts and uh, co-author of the, of the chapter on collision risks. So actually the, the element team is uh, quite uh, deeply involved in this, uh, in this work uh, area. So, as everyone knows, uh, the development of renewable energies, uh, including marine renewable energy, um, will significantly help at mitigating uh, our CO2 emissions and, uh, and thus uh, climate change. But, um, but stakeholders uh, have concerns uh, about marine renewable energy and regulatory processes are currently not well suited to, to tidal projects. In particular, uh, the risking uh, MRE project is better assessed uh, following a, a deploy uh, device and monitoring the effects uh, strategy rather than a traditional pre-application uh, survey approach, which does not um, address key areas of uncertainty. Uh, these concerns are mainly driven by uh, unfamiliarity with uh, new technologies uh, that are marine renewable energy. Uh, which will use ocean space uh, that is uh, not very well known because uh, uh, it's really harsh environment uh, where it's not easy to, to go and to, and to survey. Um, and the, the collection, the improvement and the share of information uh, can just simplify the consent uh, and deployment of devices as well as decrease uh, scientific uh, uncertainty. So to give you a, a brief overview of potential effects of marine renewable energy on marine environments, uh, I present you this illustration, um, a part of the uh, OS environmental work, uh, which shows different marine renewable uh, energy device, uh, a wave converter, a tidal turbine, um, point and sub absorber. Uh, it's, uh, it's a spirit view because uh, all these devices uh, are usually not um, uh, plugged together, but uh, it's just to, to have the general idea. Uh, and, uh, and it shows uh, also the, the, the cables uh, and the different components of, uh, of this energy. Um, and uh, the, the main uh, associated risks, uh, environmental risks, uh, so the, the emission of uh, noise and electromagnetic field, uh, the entanglement uh, question, also uh, oceanographic condition uh, changes, uh, habitat change and, uh, and uh, uh, habitat change with, which include uh, the reef effect and the footprint effect and collision risk. And uh, the, the OES um, environmental coordinated, so by, um, by Andrea Coping and uh, et al, uh, has gathered all existing data uh, and knowledge regarding these questions, this, uh, potential risks associated with marine renewable energy um, to, into the state of the science report, um, which you can see uh, here. Uh, and its third edition uh, has been released a, a, few, a few months ago. So the, the state of the art is uh, really up to date. 
And based on this uh, extensive work, uh, Andrea Coping uh, et al. Uh, were able to measure risks uh, according to uh, existing information, uh, need of new research, need uh, for monitoring data, and need for improvement in modelization, and, uh, and build this, uh, these dials, uh, which actually shows um, uh, level of risks. So if the dial turns uh, green, uh, the risk is really low, and if it turns red, the, the risk is, uh, is high. And you can see that uh, uh, several risks are actually really low, um, such as the entanglement um, risk, for example, which uh, actually concerns um, uh, large migratory wells, uh, which, and this is a, rich, a risk which uh, has been raised um, because of the entanglement of marine mammals uh, with fishing gear and lines, but uh, marine renewable energy cables and lines do not have loose ends uh, or sufficient slack to create an, entangle, uh, an entangling loop uh, as does uh, fishing, fishing gear, sorry. So uh, this risk is really, is really low. Other risks uh, are high, uh, such as the collision risk, uh, noise and EMF uh, emissions. Uh, however, it's, uh, it's worth uh, noting that uh, considering single devices or small array of tidal turbines, uh, these, uh, these three risks, risks are considered uh, really low as well. And actually, uh, underwater noise and electromagnetic field risks uh, are um, in the process of being uh, retired following uh, the risk retirement process developed by the US Environmental Task. Um, as, uh, as considering this scale of device, uh, the, the, the risk is, uh, is really, really low. So I invite you um, to, to look at this report, uh, which uh, is an extensive one, uh, as you can see here in the, in the main points uh, regarding the, the SOS report. Uh, because today I will only focus on a very small part of, uh, of it, uh, so, so you can find uh, it following this, uh, this link. It's, uh, it's fully, uh, fully accessible. So as I said, I, I will focus only on a small part, looking at uh, three potential risks uh, or changes. So the underwater noise, the collision risk, and habitat change. So regarding the collision risk uh, around turbines, um, the concerns are for marine mammals, uh, fish, and also diving seabirds. Uh, however, only a few observations of, um, of animals have been, uh, have been seen around uh, uh, the, the turbines, uh, but no collision, no, no harm have been reported. Uh, but there is still uh, a need for observation to validate the collision risk models. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, the perceived risk remain, uh, remains high. Regarding the risk from uh, underwater noise, uh, the concerns are for marine species that, using, uh, that uh, use sound um, to, to communicate, to navigate, to feed, for example. Um, and the behavioral effects of uh, noise emission um, are really difficult and costly to, to investigate, uh, but there are some tools um, which currently exist um, to set thresholds uh, of noise emission, and uh, also in the near future there would be standard regarding um, noise uh, emission levels uh, to help um, uh, mitigating this risk. And uh, the measurements of noise uh, emitted by some turbines and also um, uh, wave energy converters uh, that are available are all below these guidelines. Regarding uh, the changes in habitats, um, these changes have been uh, rated at low risk, uh, but concerns exist regarding the loss of sensitivity of sensitive um, habitats. Uh, such as the therabeds or kelp forest, for example, uh, which, um, uh, is as, uh, as, which is a risk that um, is avoidable um, by seated MRE projects outside rare habitats. Um, besides the, the footprint effect linked uh, to the installation of a, uh, a device on the seafloor, uh, changes of habitats also relate to, to reef effects. And uh, on this matter, there is still some gaps to, to fill uh, because composition of biofueling uh, and reef assemblages uh, at MRE sites is not well known currently. So gathering uh, such info uh, is really important um, 
both for um, uh, answer environmental uh, questions uh, such as uh, the detection of potential uh, invasive species, for example, but also uh, it's important for engineering um, questions, uh, as Peter has uh, uh, recalled earlier on. Uh, for example, uh, what are the, the functional groups or the volume of the biocolonization, what is growing on the, uh, on the device? So in the frame of the element project, uh, we aimed at gathering information and knowledge to fill some of the gaps um, uh, identified in the state of the science report and at accelerating the consenting for tidal energy. And uh, for, the, for, for this purpose, uh, together with uh, Nova, uh, OERO Catapult, Chantier Bretagne Sud, Guinard Energy and Wood, we considered um, two sites where tidal turbines are deployed or will be uh, deployed. Um, so the, the Shetland test site uh, uh, in UK, which is an open sea uh, tidal test site, and also the uh, Etel site uh, in Brittany, France, uh, which is located in an estuary. Uh, so we've chosen these two sites to set up environmental monitoring to survey the environmental effects of tidal turbines within these two contrasted uh, environments. At the Blue Mool uh, test site, the collision risk uh, has been surveyed through visual countings. Um, so over uh, a thousand hours of land-based bird and mammal observations, and also through video surveys um, uh, using um, cameras that are located at different parts of the tidal turbines, uh, um, as you can see uh, on this picture. Uh, and the video surveys uh, has reached uh, 20,000 hours of uh, video footage. Uh, so the, the, the sampling is quite uh, ex extensive. And um, based on this data, four main species has been uh, observed close to the turbine. Uh, the arbor seal, uh, the European shag, uh, the black guillemot, and uh, the Atlantic polack. Uh, these species have been observed uh, at slack tide, so when the turbine uh, was not operating, except for the Atlantic Polack uh, that has been observed uh, when operating, but not uh, af at full speed. And no collision, no harm have been observed. At the Etel test site, uh, we are setting up uh, an environmental monitoring plan we developed for the element project, which includes uh, one year uh, of biofooling uh, survey observation uh, at three stations and the measurements of uh, environmental variables uh, that are um, uh, really useful to, um, um, uh, to interpret the, the biocolonization uh, data. Uh, and this Environmental variables uh, are the temperature, the salinity, also the current, uh, the, the oxygen concentration, the chlorophyll, the turbidity, and pH. Uh, noise uh, will also be measured using uh, a method that uh, uh, decrease ambient noise, uh, and noise measurements will be uh, done during low and high human activity in the, in the area, uh, and during also turbine operation. Um, so that's the plan, and uh, just uh, for you to, to have an idea of what uh, is, uh, is setting up uh, uh, down there, Netel. So it's uh, the three boys with uh, the, the panels for the biocolonization measurements, as well as uh, the probe, the ADCP for the, the current measurements, hydrophone, etc. And uh, if we take a big breath, uh, breath and um, uh, go dive to see what it looks like under the water. You can see uh, the boys with, uh, with the mooring where uh, the system, um, where the, the panels for biofilm measurements and probes will be, uh, will be set, uh, which is um, close to the surface as uh, the, the turbine which will be tested there will be um, floating turbine. And then if we go uh, on the seafloor, it's at uh, a bit more than 10, 10 meters uh, at low tide. So it takes a bit time to go, to go on the seafloor. You can see, I advanced just a little bit. You can see um, the tripod, which is uh, carry, 
which is carrying uh, the ADCP for current measurements and the, and the battery. So to, to wrap up my presentation, I wanted to highlight that uh, to date, uh, no, neg no negative effects have been detected uh, considering tidal energy uh, devices or small arrays. Um, but there are still some breaks to the development of tidal energy projects. So there is a, uh, a strong need to accelerate consenting uh, of tidal energy devices, uh, given that uh, many risks can be retired at this uh, scale, the, the device and the small array scale. And at the same time, there is a need to gather in situ data to refine some models, uh, especially the collision risk models, but also the traffic fluxes models, uh, or to answer site-specific questions. This is the case, for example, for, for the estuary where um, there is concerns about uh, noise. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, we have a few slides from Anik on measuring the socio-economic benefits of tidal energy. So we can share your screen there. So, can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yep, if you put it on presenter mode, that's it. Yep. There we go. And then could you flip it again? Remember, we did the... Oh, I thought it would do it yeah, automatically. No, it's okay. Okay, there you go. Thank you. So, um, again, uh, hello. Um, so, uh, Edita and myself are working on the uh, socioeconomic uh, work package in Elements and uh, also uh, part of the socioeconomic uh, development for ONFET as well. And so I'm going to present uh, some information related to that um, ta aspect. So um, the, the socioeconomic impact, so there are you know, benefits uh, that we can uh, highlight. So the key benefits of uh, tidal areas uh, to the local and national economies and societies. So um, first, uh, as uh, my colleagues have mentioned, um, you already have uh, quite a large, um, um, uh, large potential sites available. So you have the coast, uh, you have estuary, you have river. Um, so uh, the impacts can be quite close to those three types of sites. Um, and um, basically, the idea here is to say that for for the businesses. Uh, that are uh, close to these uh, tidal areas, they can help uh, in the supply chain, uh, in products and services, and therefore uh, increase their revenue uh, and increase the local jobs. Um, so there's a, a good benefit for the businesses. From an educational point of view as well, um, having tidal turbines uh, is, is an eye opener for, uh, for students, uh, even uh, school children. Um, they are um, eye opener into ecological uh, um, ideas and um, it can help them, students um, decide to focus on um, a specialization uh, in, in a job or at uh, studies um, and then increase the, the local workforce uh, once they are uh, adults. Um, for the citizens, the impacts are that um, citizens can benefit from the electricity, so um, are, would become consumers, as would be the case for, for businesses as well. Um, the uh, price could be uh, become competitive once we have uh, reduced the LCOE even further. Um, citizens uh, also who are um, receiving their electricity through the tidal turbines uh, will have a, a better ecological footprint. Uh, and um, also the, the fact that they can um, 
have their electricity being consumed while the electricity is being produced, uh, which is much easier in, uh, in the tidal energy than maybe in uh, solar panels, uh, where we know the sun is high uh, in the early afternoon. Um, but not everyone is at home in the early afternoon to be able to use that electricity uh, directly then. So um, synchronous um, consuming is useful here. Um, the electricity uh, is renewable. That's created through the tidal turbines. It's local, so um, it's not being uh, coming from far through uh, big cabling. Uh, it's predictable, as my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, it reduces uh, CO2 and uh, reduces the uh, electricity peak on the grid, uh, which uh, can also be uh, useful for um, resilience of the electricity. And potential electricity supply could be thought through um, going through a utility, uh, being sold peer to peer, uh, being uh, shared through energy communities, uh, such as renewable energy communities, uh, um, citizen energy communities, local energy communities. So within the observations that have already happened uh, with the Shetland tidal array through ENFET, um, here are some interesting figures that we can uh, note from uh, March 2020. So uh, there has been a demonstrated positive economic impact. Uh, the supply chain growth expanded to 14 European countries uh, in 2019, 100% uh, of the spend was within Europe. So it confirms as well that it's not just the local supply chain or the local uh, community that is, and businesses that are uh, helping, but, uh, and, and being ben benefiting from, from the uh, uh, new jobs and, and, and new produ products, but also um, it, it's helping the whole of Europe. And over 60% uh, of the expenditure uh, for that Shetland tidal uh, area was done remotely north of Scotland. So still 60% locally. So good for local communities near coasts. Uh, um, local community engagement strategy for, for this and for future tidal energy projects. So there's been um, uh, 105. Um, so we sent a questionnaire to the, uh, to the Shetland Island um, residents and uh, received a 23% response rate to that local authority questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire was broad. It didn't only include tidal questions, but uh, there were four questions related to tidal area. The other questions were uh, uh, asked by the local authorities on other projects. And so that was 105 responses out of the 455 um, questionnaires that were sent out. There have been also well-attended uh, focus group discussions and school workshops that have been organized. And uh, there was a presence at a local annual fair, which was uh, a fair mainly uh, focusing on agriculture, uh, where the ONFED project was showcased um, with a stand and, and people could come up and ask questions. Um, so there's significant local support and socioeconomic impact. So 40 local Shetland suppliers uh, were involved for the, the ONFED project. 85% uh, uh, of local support to the tidal, to tidal energy and 90%, uh, so it would increase up to 90% if projects uh, deliver local economic impact. So uh, uh, even, even better uh, acceptance and engagement. So, um, the, for the element project, um, it's uh, still something new, um, but um, it's uh, something that we will be able to uh, continue to uh, monitor maybe and, uh, and, and, and have the, the, the French view as well. And that's all from me for the socioeconomic impact. And I'll uh, go to a next slide. Here we go. Uh, on the last question, uh, and 
Heather, I leave it to you to open the panel discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So that will go through all of the. I'm getting the answer. Okay, then you could go on mute, honey. Sorry. Thanks. That's better. Um, yes, and that's us been through all of our presentations now, and we're going to have a discussion with the panelists before we open to our Q and A's. Um, so yes, thank you, Anna, for sharing that slide. Um, moving on to our discussion point, with the experience we have all gained from working in tidal energy development, what do we think are the prospects for tidal energy in Europe in the coming years? And as you can see here, we have a few questions to consider. So by outlining, thinking about where are we now, where, what are the existing sites in Europe? Um, Everlene, if you've got, you think you had a map to maybe share, or we could move on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. So um, it's not so, so easy to answer to this question. Um, but um, fortunately, some experts uh, did some work before and could um, estimate uh, roughly uh, what is uh, uh, potential uh, in Europe that can be technically uh, exploited. That means um, where we can imagine uh, to install uh, turbines, tidal turbines um, in the future. Um, it has been estimated that uh, six gigawatt could be um, of tidal energy could be deployed on the major spots, as you can see here on the map from Aquaret uh, uh, around UK and uh, in the English Channel. Um, you can also read, of course, on the tables what what resource can be found uh, at the main spots. And, um, and there are some scenarios um, uh, for the deployment uh, within Europe. Um, and it is estimated that uh, if uh, the market goes uh, very slowly, uh, we could reach um, only um, 700 megawatt by uh, 230 in Europe, but um, on the other hand, if uh, we reach uh, LCOEs that are um, at the right uh, level, I would say, uh, then uh, we could go uh, to a more optimistic scenario with 2.4 gigawatt installed uh, by 2030. So, um, of course, it's, it's, uh, there's a strong uh, dependence on uh, uh, what can uh, be achieved in terms of, uh, of cost. And uh, this is also uh, one of the reasons uh, why we are doing uh, projects as uh, element. Well, thank you. And a bit of a general question, maybe a few people could chip in here. But, um, what, are, what is your prediction for tidal energy development in Europe? Um, maybe go to Peter. To show up. Um, sorry about that. Um, it, okay, yeah, I guess a few things about tidal energy in Europe. One, I guess the main point, and I think Anik made this as well, is that what we've seen during ONFET is that tidal energy is already a European industry as it is. I think we've hit it, we have a supply chain out of 19 EU countries. Um, we're also seeing that most of the developers and most technology and most of the expertise is based in Europe, both in the UK and in France. And if you're looking even at what's happening in Canada, where there's a whole lot of projects in development over the next few years, most of that technology and most of the developers are European with a European supply chain. So from that perspective, Europe is the center of tidal energy technology and innovation in the world. Um, there's also, we've also made some major strides over the last few years just by the number of turbines being installed and technological innovation you're seeing. And you're seeing installations both in the UK and in France and turbines working and being working like Chatham has been operational for five years now. And 
it hasn't always been perfect, but we have learned a lot and we're seeing major improvements um, and costs coming down with every single deployment. Um, so we are, I think we are on track to meet those LCTOE requirements set up by the EU. And I think you can really see, really see it um, as we're, there's a really good momentum coming for Tidal, especially also with green recovery from COVID um, coming in. So I don't, I'm not like, I don't, we have a few, as Nova, we have a few projects on development, which I'm really excited about. I don't really know, I can't really speak to that it's say, I can't really say that it's going to explode over the next few years, but there's a steady momentum going. There's a whole lot of interesting title sites in France um, as well, which are under development. And as part of development, we're actually looking at the whole, we're doing a full analysis of what's, what's possible in France and what potential title sites are. And France is one of our target markets. So I think if you're looking, if you're talking tile energy in Europe, you're talking UK and France, and then potentially moving on from there. Uh, but even if you see those initial deployments not happening in Europe, you'll, there's still European technology being deployed abroad and increased learnings for European tile energy as well. Thank you. I don't know if any other of our panelists want to chip in to that question before we move on. Um, it's it's Anik. So I would just like to say that um, to uh, jump up on something Peter mentioned. So indeed, within the element project, um, the um, the partners are we are looking at uh, ten French sites that we're analyzing in depth. Um, so indeed, uh, there's still a lot of uh, interesting work um, that's going to come up. Um, that are uh, reports that are going to come up uh, this year normally on uh, those French sites assessments uh, as well as the uh, socioeconomic uh, impacts to the region. That's all. Thank you. And then Noreen or Evelyn, have you got anything you want to chip in there before we move on? Not on my side. No, no, it's a good discussion though. So the next question I have is, what do we see as the obstacles to the development of tidal energy? And, and the solutions and maybe how has COVID affected the journey to tidal becoming bigger? And you kind of touched on that, Peter, that hopefully yeah. the recovery from COVID that tidal could step in there. But are there any other obstacles that you see for Tidal? Um, I mean, I think in the first case scenario, the costs need to come down, um, which is what we're working on, which is why projects like Onfet and Element are so important to help with those cost reductions. And we're seeing that Tidal Energy is on track to become competitive with more established forms generations by 2025, 2030. Like we're, we're already competitive with um, we're already able to displace diesel on remote islands um, and make it more cost efficient. So that is like the cost is coming down. Um, there's this usual, we need to this um, convincing regulators about the fact that there's no environmental impact is also really important, which is why another reason why gathering all this environmental data and showing that there's no environmental impact of tidal turbines uh, two projects like Confed and Element is so important. And actually, Marine Scotland just came out last week with a report that there was no environmental impact of our Shetland Tidal Array, which was major. That's major, major news um, for us. So I think those are the two, two main, two are two like streamlining the consenting and bringing the cost down are the two main barriers. And we are working on that. We're making good headway. So uh, I'm very optimistic about meeting um, the 2025 and 2030 targets. Yes, j just to jump on on, uh, on uh, uh, your comment, Peter, um, regarding the, the environmental impact, uh, that's true that, uh, uh, and I've shown uh, through my presentation that uh, as a, there is really, really low risks um, and, uh, and uh, consenting uh, is still a bit problematic uh, at some sites uh, because of uh, some fears or 
or um, lack of um, of information actually so uh, increase of uh, share of the information uh, regarding uh, the absence of, uh, uh, indeed of environmental impact uh, at uh, at uh, array uh, scale and uh, and device scale is really important to to decrease uh, potential obstacles i think thank you Anybody else? Or we could wrap up our discussion and move on to our Q&A. Um, it's me, Yannick. Um, so just, uh, I think uh, also the community aspects uh, can become obstacles, uh, as we see sometimes with wind turbines, for example, where mm -hmm. uh, communities have the uh, the NIMBY effect of uh, not in my backyard, you know, it's good over there, but not, not next to me. And, uh, and I think in tidal uh, projects, that what's great, and I think uh, Peter's uh, photos are fantastic to show that, is that there's no visual impact. Um, there's no, uh, you know, it, there's no noise. Um, so there's a lot of uh, um, positive aspects that uh, tidal have compared to, for example, wind turbines, which, um, which help the communities accept it. But at the same time, there's still always uh, community um, um, concerns that need to be looked at, such as um, fishermen who might be worried uh, that they can't go over the, the turbines with their boats or things like that. So those type of uh, concerns need also to be uh, looked at and um, demystified um, so that communities can better uh, assess that it's it's great to have one. <laughs> yes, agreed. Okay, so I think we should wrap up the discussion there and take a few questions from the audience. We've had quite a lot of questions come in. Um, we will do our best to get through them all, but if we don't get back to you, we will write back and we'll be circulating more information after the webinar. And you can also email us at info at element-project.eu if there are any further questions that come to mind after the webinar. So without further ado, the first question we have regarding the tide direction, and maybe Peter, you could comment on this one. Are the turbine, is the turbine head able to rotate to face the tide direction? Uh, they're not actually. We've, spe we've specifically designed them to without a pitch or a yaw mechanism, so they stay put the entire time. Uh, this was done to reduce um, engineering risks and costs, so make because sure, that's not one thing that can break. Um, our engineers can explain to you exactly how it works, but basically the, the blades are bidirectional, so they work in both directions of the tide. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, for Nova. Um, do the Nova turbines at Blue Mill Sound all share a single export cable to the grid? And if so, what challenges does this pose for controlling multiple turbines simultaneously? Uh, they don't. So every single turbine currently has its own designated cable running to the uh, running to shore. Um, that's done because it's more cost effective than developing a hub because we're very close to the shore. Um, we are looking at some potential cable hubs for sites that are further away from shore, but so far it's more cost effective and easier to just um, have a designated cable to shore. And then I think we have a question about, maybe for Peter to come back. There we go. <laughs> all good. Yeah, all good. Uh, thinking about maintenance of the turbines, what's what are the major challenges during the maintenance um, and in which section from turbine in which section from turbine have higher failure rates? Um, once again, I'm not an engineer, so I not feel confident talking about the second part of it. Uh, maintenance, I think. We've we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of learnings, and we've actually gotten really good at taking these turbines out of the water really quickly. Um, just kind of like a, the way it's been going, like we can basically take out a turbine during a slack tide now um, and then 
bring them down to Edinburgh. So maintenance wise, challenging wise, it's um, it's all about now. It's all it's we're, we don't we no longer have any issues doing the operations. It's now all just about extending the uh, the, the time between scheduled maintenance, um, and that's what we're doing with Onfed as well. So um, coming up, trying to improve, just making sure the turbines last um, for two years, and we're doing really well with that and it's on track. And maybe for then our more technical questions, we can write back to the attendees or put you on the spot. Um, yeah, no worries about that. Another question came in. Is marine energy also relevant to inland urban development or only relevant to coastal areas? I don't know. No way. Have you got any comments on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, a small comment. Uh, I think it's depending on the on the size of the turbines, but uh, some turbines can be deployed uh, in rivers, um, and and actually uh, one of the of the turbines from Nova Innovation will be deployed in an estuary. So in this case, uh, I think some part of land communities can benefit from tidal renewable energy or oh, tidal uh, currents <laughs> renewable energy. I think mm -hmm. you just have to modify the technology, but the same principles. Um, more questions coming in. One for Peter. You mentioned a solution to the effects biofilling can have on tidal turbines. If possible, are you able to share any information about this? Um, yeah, we're, we're using a coating on the blades. Um, exactly what coating? I don't know, and I also couldn't tell you because that's commercially sensitive information at this point. <laughs> so just a special golden. Um, <laughs> do you think it's realistic that there will be hundreds of megawatts deployed every year over this in the next eight years? Peter, do you, what do you think? Um, I think it depends on how the next few years go. Um, we're seeing some big projects being developed in Canada. We're seeing uh, some projects being proposed in the UK and we're seeing projects being proposed in France. If all of those, or if a majority of those go well, and I'm really hoping they do, and I think we're at the point where technology is able to actually, to actually and the developers are getting mature enough to actually do these projects really well, then I think we can Hit a, hit a tipping point where we can start getting more and more of these projects developed. So next few years will be really important uh, to prove to everyone technology works and that the sector is ready to become commercial and bankable. Mm -hmm. Another question kind of leading nicely from that. Um, someone's commented, we've just begun a project to characterize the tidal resource around the Isles of Sicily. Do, does the panel have any advice on the cost-effective methods to gather this bankable tidal flow data? Peter, could you comment on that? Um, sure. Um, on the technical side of things, I'll have to stay mute, but I, what, from experience, what we found is it's better to have Specific, very specific and very high quality data for a few sites that you think are are really good to go rather than having this blanket data for an entire area of lower quality. So if possible, identify a few a few sites that you think are high priority and really focus on those. Um, and even if you if you talk to a few developers as well. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's it. Like the high, the, the higher qual, the higher the higher quality data is the easier it is for developers to know whether or not their turbines will work in those areas. Yeah. Um, we have another question, and I understand that the turbine platform has to be positioned on the seabed, but would there be any alternative for those areas and islands where there's no nearby continental shelf? And another question, is there data recorded on system activity under adverse conditions? I think all of these questions, Peter, unfortunately. 
<laughs> so yes, we, there there is. We are working on a floating solution. Um, so a floating substructure solution. Um, so that would replace the bottom, the gravity-based structure, and just have a have a basically have a floating uh, platform for the turbine, which would is beneficial in certain areas. Um, such as areas that are too deep um, for our current turbines. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question, Heather? Mm -hmm, no worries. Um, uh, is there data recorded on system activity under adverse conditions? You mean in like storms and those kind of things, I guess? Yeah, so just severe weather. Um, I guess, yeah, no, I don't I haven't seen any formal data on that, but uh, we've been operating for five years and we've had our fair share of storms up there and those turbines haven't moved an inch. So we are we are protected. So we because we're, we're 30 meters deep, um, so we are pretty much protected from the most severe impact of storms. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't really get any impact from high winds or those kind of things. Um, but no, it hasn't been, we haven't noticed any impact um, in the last five years. Of severe yeah, weather. up in Shetland is pretty extreme weather conditions as well. Yeah, it gets windy up there. Yeah, we have a question and you'll be glad to know, not for Peter, <laughs> for Everly. Do, do you think Tidal could compete against other renewables connected to the grid? On what existing commitments from EU countries are referring to these deployment numbers for 2030? Well, um, what we believe is that uh, it's uh, um, complementary to, to other renewable sources. So, um, well, so, so I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's not, uh, of course, uh, today, if uh, you compare to offshore wind with uh, 50 uh, Europe megawatts, and, uh, we cannot directly compete uh, today and uh, maybe not uh, uh, in, in the coming years, but uh, the target is really to bring uh, an additional source uh, of energy to the grid. Um, um, excuse me for the next question. It's actually <laughs> on, so on what existing commitments from EU countries are referring these deployment numbers for 2030? Well, it's um, it's um, a study uh, that uh, focused on uh, on potential, uh, not on commitments from European countries. Unfortunately, uh, we hope it will come soon. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. We have a few more questions before we wrap up. We'll try and get through these. Um, Someone's put net gain and ecosystem services are becoming more considered in environmental assessment. What are the potential environmental benefits and net gains of tidal array technologies? Maybe yourself, Evelyn or Noreen could comment. Yeah, I'm um, uh, actually the, the definition of ecosystem services is not my specialty, but um, I know some projects are currently ongoing to define uh, the ecosystem services provided by uh, marine renewable energy deployments. Uh, so I cannot give more details right now, but uh, yes, there is ongoing work to define uh, the, the, these services. Thank you. Um, we have another question now. Uh, are turbines pitched by 180 degrees and rotor speeds inverted to work with bidirectional tides? Also, what exactly is art art sorry, artificial intelligence used for in control? Um, I'm aware that we're getting quite a few technical questions through now. Um, Peter, maybe if you could do your best to answer, but if not, we could follow up afterwards. Um, so I guess the first one I've already answered. So no turbines stay in place. Uh, there's no pitching or yawing. So the blades are bidirectional, but the turbines itself don't move. Uh, regarding artificial intelligence, basically what we're doing is we're trying to improve the way we, we turbine, the turbine currently gathers a whole lot of data. Uh, and what we're trying to do is improve ways of using the data we are already gathering and using it to predict, um, to predict, 
to predict what's going to happen and how the turbine will react to the impact to the environment. Um, if you want to know the actual technical stuff, there was a really good technical webinar on Elements, which is on YouTube right now, which I can, uh, we can share the link with you as well. Uh, but that goes in a bit more detail into what exactly um, the AI and the machine learning aspects of it are. Yeah. And what are your thoughts, Peter, when you're thinking about tidal energy? Um, do you think it shows good potential to compete with other sustainable energy resources such as wind and solar? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, um, so first on the cost savings, if you're looking at where we are compared to where wind and solar were, we're you look, you're seeing, we're seeing on this, we're seeing the same trajectory for tidal as we saw in wind and solar, it's costs coming down really, really fast. Uh, with increased deployments. I know Catapult did a really good report on that to show like how, what, what level of deployment is required to bring those costs down. And you'll see that in, even at like lower level of deployment, costs are coming down really quickly. Tidal also has one unique benefit on wind and solar, which is that we're completely predictable. Um, we know exactly how much we'll be generating at any given point in the future, uh, which makes it really easy for us and for grid operators to kind of predict the impact of tidal on the grid and help balance the grids, which will be necessary as soon as we start phasing out more baseload energy, such as coal and nuclear. Yeah. Um, couple more questions. Another one for Peter. How many turbines do you envisage to be feasible to install before energy losses due to turbine weak interactions become problematic? That's what we're researching as part of OMFET. Um, <laughs> so we should be able to give you the answer in a few years. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah when we don't, I think it. it's definitely more than we're installing right now, um, but we'll have the answer. We're working on getting the answer from this part of OMFET. Yeah. And one final question before we wrap up. Um, regarding the analysis of the marine environment, You've commented on certain fauna that has approached near the areas of operation of the system, but what happens with mitigated species? At an economic level, what kind of business partnerships do you have planned? Yes, sorry, is there? I, I didn't get the last part of the question. Um... Yeah, at an economic level, what kind of business partnerships do you have planned? So I think this may be another one for Peter. And yeah, I think so. <laughs> Environmental questions, but uh... okay. I'm gonna pass. I'm gonna pass the first part back to Nolan, I think, um, and then I'll I can do the economic. I can answer. I can give an evasive answer on the economic business partnerships uh, afterwards. Okay. Yeah, I, I've mentioned four uh, species uh, which has been observed uh, close to the turbine deployed in Shetland but um, those species are not actually commercial species, uh, except for Atlantic Polak, but uh, the, the commercial value is not super high. Um, but I know that uh, in some uh, other offshore uh, energy um, projects, uh, they combine uh, the settlement of, uh, uh, of the structure with, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, metilliculture, so the, the, the um, culture of um, uh, of metilocedulis. Uh, so yeah, but uh, but regarding the species that have been seen around the the turbine in Shetland, um, I don't think there is a commercial impact. Thank you. And then that final question, then Peter, at an economic level, what kind of business partnerships do you have planned? Um. It's a bit of a broad question. I mean, we have our we have our suppliers that we use to develop the turbine, uh, and then we're part of a whole bunch of EU projects. Um, so I think that's kind of what we're working on right now. And and the any any business partnerships that can be made public will be made public <laughs> at the appropriate time. Yeah. Well, thank you. There's been lots of questions come in. Um, sorry if we've not managed to respond on the webinar. Um, we will do our best to get back to you offline. Um, just want to finally thank all the panel for all your presentations and put on the spot questions. Um, and thank you to everyone that's joined us today.
Um, if you would like more information on Element or on FIT that we've referred to, you can find out more at element-project.eu. We'll be posting details of this webinar and upcoming webinars there. And as mentioned, we have um, already one other webinar up there that you might not have seen, so we'll definitely go and check that out. Um, and yeah, we'd hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.